The following program was produced by the Central Intelligence Agency. July 17th, 1996, 819 p.m. Throughout this video, the TWA 800 project team has paused the narration to correct false and misleading information. Transworld Airlines Flight 800 departs from New York's John F. Kennedy Airport en route to Paris. Twelve minutes into the flight, as the airliner climbs to its cruising altitude, there is a catastrophic explosion, and Boeing 747 plunges into the Atlantic Ocean nine miles off the coast of Long Island. All 230 people aboard perish, making it one of the most lethal disasters in commercial aviation history. Since that tragic night more than one year ago, investigators have been working continuously seeking the source of the explosion. They have focused on three possible causes, a bomb, a missile, or a mechanical failure. A particular concern to FBI investigators were reports from dozens of eyewitnesses who on the evening of July 17th recalled seeing an object usually described as a flare or firework ascend and culminate in an explosion. Arching from like my right to my left. A lot of people saw things in the sky and a lot of people saw what we think is the same thing. Those witnesses are, they're good people and they told us what they saw. I'd like to know what I saw. I'd like to put it to rest. I'd feel a lot better if I knew that someone wasn't out there in a boat with a missile. Before this video was publicly released, the FBI interviewed hundreds of eyewitnesses, hundreds of credible eyewitnesses, including military eyewitnesses, that told the FBI that what they had seen was a missile. Based on many eyewitnesses that saw something come from the ground or the surface to that aircraft, the FBI actually concluded that the eyewitnesses did, in fact, most likely see a missile specifically a MANPAD missile. Beyond that, the NTSB's eyewitness group chairman, Norman Wiemeyer, concluded that out of 102 eyewitnesses that reported the origin of a streak of light, 96, that's 96 out of 102 people who saw an object rise off the surface and go up to that aircraft. Flight 800 at the time was at 2.6 miles in altitude, that's 13,800 feet on its way to Paris when these witnesses saw something rise from the surface to meet it and cause it to crash. Uh, this video was shown by the FBI at a press conference only three weeks before the National Transportation Safety Board was scheduled to uh, discuss the eyewitness evidence. After this video was shown, the FBI contacted the NTSB and persuaded them not to allow any eyewitness to ever testify. And none did. The reports were not discussed, no eyewitness testified, and this CIA video became the uh, final word on the eyewitnesses for two and a half years. Uh, that entire time, all the eyewitness reports were kept secret. They did not release them publicly. Was it a missile? Did foreign terrorists destroy the aircraft? At the request of the FBI, CIA weapons analysts looked into this possibility. The CIA's conclusion? The eyewitnesses did not see a missile. Up front, and without providing any evidence, the CIA telegraphs their conclusion to the viewer which is actually not supported by the evidence. They plant this conclusion in the viewer's mind so it stays there while they watch the video. The eyewitness sightings of greatest concern, the ones originally interpreted to be of a possible missile attack, took place after the aircraft exploded. This is false. The CIA knew that the eyewitnesses of greatest concern were those who saw something rise up before Flight 800 exploded. So right away, two minutes into their video, they telegraphed two false conclusions to the viewer. What these eyewitnesses saw was in fact the Boeing 747 in various stages of crippled flight. This third conclusion is also false, planted in the viewer's mind before a case is made or any evidence is ever shown. It is not possible for a streak of light that originates at the surface to be Flight 800 in any stage of crippled flight. It traversed parts of the sky that Flight 800 never occupied. This object was going straight up from the surface, according to many eyewitnesses, and very fast. It was moving very rapidly. It was fast. Zoop, just like that. It was far too fast. I've never seen a plane go that fast, up like that. About 12 minutes after takeoff, the flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder aboard Flight 800 suddenly ceased operating. 
These devices carry their own clocks and record time along with other information. The flight data recorder registered no unusual activity before it stopped working. However, the cockpit voice recorder registered a fraction of a second of loud noise just before it stopped. National Transportation Safety Board analysts concluded this sound was associated with the beginning of the destruction of the aircraft. Based on flight recorder data and airport radar tracking, the aircraft's location, altitude, speed, and heading at the instant the recorder stopped are known. The airport radar tracking data shows Flight 800 beginning its crash sequence at 2.6 miles in altitude. It also indicates that Flight 800 banked left sharply and descended immediately. This all contradicts the CIA video. And, in fact, the CIA knew this. Weeks before the CIA video was released, an internal CIA email argued that their video could not possibly be correlated with the radar data. This information was used to determine the distance and direction from the aircraft to each eyewitness at the moment the aircraft exploded, making it possible to calculate how long sound from the explosion took to reach each eyewitness and to associate what eyewitnesses heard with what they saw. Now the CIA is pointedly ignoring the significant group of eyewitnesses who saw a rising streak originate at the surface and redirecting the viewer's attention to a far less significant grouping of eyewitnesses who heard sounds. This is a common disinformation technique known as look here, not there. Only 27% of the eyewitnesses heard sounds and a vast majority of these eyewitnesses heard sounds well after the aircraft hit the water because Flight 800, to most eyewitnesses, was more than eight miles away. To understand this concept, consider the technique used to determine how far away a lightning strike is. This is done by measuring the delay between when an observer sees a lightning strike and hears the thunder it causes. The delay occurs because sound travels about 1,100 feet per second, and light is nearly instantaneous. An observer who hears thunder five seconds after seeing lightning knows that the lightning strike is approximately one mile away. On the evening of July 17th, many eyewitnesses reported hearing a loud boom as part of their observations. The closest of these eyewitnesses was more than eight miles from where Flight 800 exploded. Any sound heard at that distance and produced in the aircraft before the recording ended would have been recorded. So we can be confident that no loud sound was produced before the one at the end of the cockpit voice recording. This is false. A missile launch and the sound it makes when it breaks a sound barrier, the sonic booms, they can be very loud as a missile flies to the aircraft. It can sound like rolling thunder. The first sound I heard was like rolling thunder. That rolling thunder went on and it was punctuated by a, a loud boom. The sounds this eyewitness heard match his visual observations and also are consistent with an outbound missile. A missile detonating at Flight 800's position would have knocked out the black boxes before they had a chance to record the early sounds that missile made because the missile itself was traveling faster than sound. Using this fact, it was possible to associate many eyewitnesses' visual observations with things happening to Flight 800. For instance, analysts knew when Flight 800 exploded but when did the aircraft hit the water? One observer in a beachfront condo reported to FBI agents that he saw a huge, intense, orange, yellow, and red fireball drop from the sky into the ocean. Immediately after the fireball hit the water, he heard a loud boom. This is simply more redirection. They're talking about an eyewitness who heard sounds at the time that he saw a fireball erupt. This was well after the initial events. This particular portion of the eyewitness's account has no bearing on whether or not this or any other eyewitness saw a missile. It took sound 49 seconds to travel the 10 miles from the position where the plane exploded to where this eyewitness was located. So his statement established that the aircraft exploded about 49 seconds before it hit the water. A second eyewitness was located in a boat 8.8 miles from where the aircraft exploded. He observed the latter stages of the disaster, describing what he thought might be a shooting star moving in a downward 45 degree sloping arc. He then realized he was observing an aircraft. He saw one wing separate from the fuselage and a large fire trail of burning fuel erupt. Just as the wings separated, he heard a loud concussion sound. 
Correlating the time when a specific eyewitness recalls hearing a noise during a plane crash is not a reliable method of determining when events occur during that plane crash. The most reliable method is to use hard data. The black boxes. The time both of those failed together with the transponder, that's when the aircraft began its crash sequence. When the aircraft went off radar, that's the most likely time it hit the water. Any events that happen between those two times are most reliably determined by a careful analysis of the debris field. Plane and wing then quickly dropped about a mile to the water's surface. Knowing this eyewitness's distance from the aircraft when it exploded, analysts were able to calculate that the concussion sound he heard originated 42 seconds earlier. Therefore, the structural failure and fire eruption he saw began 42 seconds after the onboard recordings ended. This event was corroborated by an infrared sensor aboard a U.S. satellite, which detected a large heat source in the vicinity of the aircraft about 43 seconds after the recordings ended. A third eyewitness was a passenger on U.S. Air Flight 217. This eyewitness reported seeing a small aircraft fly under him 10 seconds before the appearance of a small flare-like projectile traveling in an east-northeasterly direction. Radar tracking of Flight 217 and the small aircraft shows that he first saw the flare-like object almost exactly when Flight 800's cockpit voice recorder detected an onboard explosion. He also specified where the flare-like object first appeared, which coincided with where Flight 800 was when it exploded. And his statement that the flare-like object was traveling in an east-northeasterly direction agrees with the direction that Flight 800 is known to have been traveling when it exploded. So the flare-like object he saw almost certainly was Flight 800 just after it exploded. This is false. We know this eyewitness. His name is Dwight Brumley, a former Master Chief in the Navy. What he saw came from his right and went to his left, opposite the direction shown in the CIA video. The CIA analyst knew about this discrepancy, but never interviewed Brumley to clear it up. I'm the person who was on the U.S. air flight that they, that they talk about. The object that I saw out the right side of the aircraft moved from my right to my left, which is per almost perpendicular to the flight path uh, that the CIA, anim CIA animation showed. Uh, nobody at the CIA ever called or talked to me about what I had seen. The FBI agents who were assigned to determine what it was the eyewitnesses saw also knew about this discrepancy. They challenged the CIA on it and said that they should not include Brumley as a template eyewitness in their animation because the relative motions Brumley saw were not consistent with the CIA's crash sequence. But then the CIA replied to the FBI saying that Brumley changed his account in a second interview. There was never a second interview with me by either the FBI, the CIA, or any other government official. I always maintained that the object moved from my right to left and I never said otherwise. Not a missile. Sounds definitive, but this conclusion was manufactured by the CIA after relying on eyewitness accounts that had no bearing on whether or not a missile was involved or not. By relying on witness accounts who heard sounds afterwards, rather than those who saw streaks of light rise from the surface, they were relying on irrelevant eyewitness accounts, ones that could not have any bearing on whether or not a missile was involved. This is a common disinformation tactic. A fourth eyewitness reported that he watched a white light, perhaps a firework, traveling upward at a steep angle with respect to the horizon. The light zigzagged as it rose, and at the apex of its travel arched over and disappeared. This observation lasted about 15 seconds. Two or three seconds later, a fireball appeared in the sky near where the white light had disappeared. The eyewitness was able to specify a landmark over which the white light first appeared, a house near the beach and a second house behind which the descending fireball disappeared. FBI investigators determined precisely where the eyewitness was standing and then measured the line of sight angle between the eyewitness and each of the two houses. Calculations based on the flight path of Flight 800 with respect to this eyewitness show that when the aircraft exploded, it was just passing over the house above which the white light first appeared. So the white light the eyewitness saw very likely was the aircraft briefly ascending and arching over after it exploded, rather than a missile attacking the aircraft. 
the CIA animation shows it approximately here in the sky, and then it proceeds from there as a streak of light up into the sky. But that's not what I saw. What I saw, something left behind the house and went up to the plane, the plane blew up. Neither the CIA nor the NTSB ever interviewed Mike Wire. And just like with Dwight Brumley, the CIA knew beforehand that his account could not match the CIA's scenario. An internal email states that what he saw could in fact have been a missile rising up and striking the aircraft. But again, as with Mr. Brumley, the CIA references an interview that never took place with Mike Wire, where he allegedly changed his observations to fit the CIA scenario. The FBI claimed that I had a third interview with them. I never had a third interview. I only had one on the phone and one in my house. The CIA never contacted me, never did an interview with me. And what I saw looked like it originated um, on the beach behind the house. It was not above the roof line of the house. This eyewitness's visual observations are consistent with the aircraft's known horizontal motion during the 49 seconds which elapsed after the onboard recordings ended. Radar data show that during this time, the aircraft traveled about 15 degrees from right to left with respect to this eyewitness, placing it near where the eyewitness claimed the fireball disappeared, behind the second house. Using these eyewitness reports and radar tracking data, CIA analysts were able to reconstruct the approximate path of Flight 800 from the instant its recordings ended until it struck the water. Weeks before this video aired, the CIA was well aware that the black box timing information and the radar data both contradicted their analysis. But they went ahead with it anyway and released it to the public. The following sequence of events is based on that analysis. Just after the aircraft exploded, it pitched up abruptly and climbed several thousand feet from its last recorded altitude of about 13,800 feet to a maximum altitude of about 17,000 feet. This is consistent with information provided by NTSB investigators and Boeing engineers who determined that the front third of the aircraft, including the cockpit, separated from the fuselage within four seconds after the aircraft exploded. This significant sudden loss of mass from the front of the aircraft caused the rapid pitch up and climb. This CIA animation of the airplane climbing is false. Just three days after this video was released to the public, the NTSB published their own report where they compared the CIA animation with radar evidence. And here's a plot of what they showed. The hollow diamonds represent what the aircraft really did. The straight line is what the CIA said the aircraft did. They do not correlate. The radar evidence shows that when the CIA says the aircraft is climbing sharply, it's actually in a steep bank where it cannot climb. The steep bank would double the stall speed of the airplane. We know that the engines uh, would have flamed out because there's no uh, positive pressure to the engine-driven fuel pumps from the AC boost pumps. And so the airplane would have uh, had to sacrifice energy to make that turn, and the only thing that it could have done is descended. Eyewitnesses reported the aircraft banking. None of them reported it climbing. And the CIA was aware that their analysis did not match the evidence. In fact, they said it could not possibly match the radar data. Regarding the Boeing engineers that the CIA referenced as confirming their analysis, there is no record of any Boeing engineer ever confirming the CIA's analysis. In fact, Boeing put out a press release the day the CIA video aired, distancing itself from that CIA video. Boeing was not involved in the production of the video shown today nor have we had the opportunity to obtain a copy or fully understand the data used to create it. The explosion, although very loud, was not seen by any known eyewitness. This is false. Some eyewitnesses reported seeing Flight 800 before, during, and after the initial explosion. However, the subsequent small fire trailing from the aircraft was visible to a few of the closest eyewitnesses on land, sea, and in other aircraft. It was repeatedly described as an ascending white light resembling a flare or firework, but it was difficult to see against the relatively light sky. Shortly after Flight 800 reached the peak of its ascent, 
about 20 seconds after it exploded, a fireball erupted from the aircraft. This was clearly visible to many eyewitnesses. The aircraft then went into a very steep and rapid descent. As the aircraft descended, it produced an increasingly visible fire trail. When the jet reached an altitude of roughly one mile, about 42 seconds after it exploded, its left wing separated from the fuselage, releasing unburned fuel. The fuel's subsequent ignition and blaze produced a dramatic cascade of flames, visible to eyewitnesses more than 40 miles away, and detected by an infrared sensor aboard a U.S. satellite. About seven seconds after the left wing detached, and 49 seconds after the initial explosion, the burning debris hit the water. What happened to the plane after it exploded has no bearing on whether or not a missile was involved. CIA analysts developed this model using observations from key eyewitnesses who were closest to the disaster and who provided detailed descriptions of what they saw and heard. This portrayal was then evaluated against descriptions provided by more than 200 additional eyewitnesses. Of these 200 eyewitnesses, only one eyewitness was given the opportunity to comment on the accuracy of the CIA scenario. That eyewitness was Joseph Delgado, and the FBI approached him and gave him a piece of paper with a CIA scenario drawn on it. Mr. Delgado said, well, that's pretty accurate, except that it's missing the entire first part. And he drew in an object rising off the surface and initiating the crash sequence. Not surprisingly, most eyewitnesses saw only the most conspicuous segment of the disaster, the fire trail and cascade of flames in the 10 to 15 seconds before the aircraft hit the water. This is true. But the CIA is using this true statement to give the false impression that all eyewitnesses are equal. Eyewitnesses who only saw the last stages of the breakup are not relevant in determining what caused the crash. The only eyewitnesses relevant to determining what caused the crash are those who saw the earliest portions of the crash sequence. These eyewitnesses, over uh, 100 of them, saw a rising streak of light. And as stated earlier, 96 of them said that rising streak of light rose off the surface. Three separate and independent studies, two of which were from the NTSB, all concluded that over 90% of the relevant eyewitnesses saw something rise off the surface and cause the crash. In this video, the CIA leaves out any solid analysis of the most relevant eyewitnesses. Instead, they redirect attention to witnesses who heard sounds and whose observations that they analyze have no bearing on whether or not a missile was involved. Analysts used two techniques to determine that these eyewitnesses saw only the end of the aircraft's descent. First, sound from the aircraft's explosion took more than 40 seconds to reach each of the 58 eyewitnesses who reported hearing sounds associated with the disaster. Therefore, any events eyewitnesses reported seeing at about the time they heard the first sound took place well after the explosion. In fact, this technique was used to determine that one eyewitness's observations began more than 17 seconds after the aircraft hit the water. This is a false conclusion based on a flawed analysis. The flaw is equating the explosion sound at flight at hundreds position with the first sound that certain eyewitnesses heard. The eyewitnesses reported seeing an object rise upward and head outbound to an offshore position where flight at hundred was flying. The sounds associated with the missile's launch from that position would have reached them first, as would the sounds of the missile breaking the sound barrier. In fact, witnesses at certain locations could have heard sounds associated with the missile's launch or flight, looked up, and still had time to see the missile travel on its way to Flight 800 before detonating. Second, many eyewitnesses, including most of those who reported hearing sounds, described only events that happened within about 10 seconds of when the left wing detached from the fuselage. Only a minority of the eyewitnesses reported hearing sounds. But some of these witnesses reported hearing rolling thunder up high in the sky, followed by a loud boom. This is actually consistent with an outbound missile detonating at flight at Hunter's position. And it's also consistent with the witness observations that described an object with that trajectory. This was an extraordinary sight, as two distinct fireballs and a trailing cascade of flames caused by the burning fuel fell to the ocean. 
Since the left wing is believed to have detached about 42 seconds after the aircraft exploded, none of these observers, a total of 223, saw events occurring near the time when the recordings ended. The important question to ask here is, how did the CIA determine that 223 people only saw the latter stages of the crash sequence? They had an obviously flawed sound analysis, and they cherry-picked eyewitnesses to fit their scenario, and they didn't fit their scenario, so they forced them to fit their scenario. Both former FBI Assistant Director James Kallstrom and former NTSB Managing Director Peter Goltz have, as late as June of 2013, gone on television distorting the eyewitness accounts, saying that most of the eyewitnesses heard sounds first. These individuals have ignored their own investigators and are repeating erroneous information put forward by the CIA. So, of the 244 eyewitness reports analyzed by the CIA, most described observations made only during the final moments of the disaster, well after the aircraft exploded. This is a continuation of the CIA's look here, not there ploy. They use sound witnesses, which are irrelevant in determining whether or not a missile was used. They rely on two eyewitnesses who did see earlier events, but what they saw contradicted their analysis. Then they used made-up facts based on interviews that never took place to buttress their conclusions. The truth is that 90% of those with unobstructed views to the horizon and who provided information regarding the origin of a streak of light said that it rose off the surface before Flight 800 exploded and crashed. The 21 eyewitnesses whose observations began earlier described what almost certainly was the aircraft in various stages of crippled flight after it exploded. Those who said they saw something ascend and culminate in an explosion probably saw the burning aircraft ascend and erupt into a fireball just after it reached its maximum altitude. Here, the CIA is saying the eyewitnesses didn't see what they said they saw, and they're providing a false explanation. That explanation says the aircraft climbed sharply while on fire. This is impossible based on radar tracking. Had Flight 800 climbed sharply on fire, or at all, it would have immediately slowed down due to the law of conservation of energy. Radar tracking shows no reduction in airspeed during this time. Therefore, there was no climb. From a distance of nine miles or more, this may have looked like a missile attacking an aircraft. The CAA continues here with its misperception ruse, even though there is one critical flaw. There is no second object. For a missile to look like it's attacking an aircraft, there needs to be two objects in the sky. In the CIA scenario, there is one object that approaches nothing. But nothing in their statements leads CIA analysts to conclude that these eyewitnesses in fact saw a missile. The CIA is giving the false impression that none of the eyewitnesses clearly indicated that they saw a missile. Here is a series of quotations taken from official documents that the CIA failed to highlight. January 11, 1997, Air National Guard Captain Chris Bauer, quote, It had a rocket-type motor, like some things in the military that I saw them shoot at other things, and it struck an object coming from the left and made it explode. January 11, 1997, Air National Guard Major Fred Meyer, quote, This looked like flak. It's a hard explosion. It's like an HPX explosion. July 26, 1996, a Polish Army veteran, whose name was redacted, quote, a medium-sized missile that would have required three experienced people to operate. July 21st, 1996, a former U.S. Air Force pilot, name redacted, with combat experience, quote, sounded like a SAM-7 missile hitting the plane. April 29th, 1997, name redacted, quote, she noticed an object which was flying toward the plane which she had been watching. She believed that she witnessed a missile which had been fired from a boat which was located somewhere on the Atlantic Ocean. July 27, 1996, name redacted. He felt the bright red object struck the plane towards the cockpit area. July 30, 1996, former Marine helicopter crew chief with top secret security clearance. Name redacted. It was a missile hitting the TWA plane. October 16, 1997, National Transportation Safety Board factual report, quote, 94% said it originated at the surface. 
end quote. Indeed, several eyewitnesses who suspected that they had watched a missile destroy an aircraft were puzzled that they hadn't actually seen the aircraft before the missile hit it. Most of the eyewitnesses who saw one airborne object strike another did not express puzzlement in the least. In fact, one was an Air National Guard helicopter pilot flying a Black Hawk helicopter on a training mission when he saw an object with a rocket-type motor strike another object coming from the left. He immediately flew to the scene for search and rescue. When he saw the number of bodies floating on the water next to sinking wreckage, he immediately recognized that the object that got struck was a commercial airline. The majority of eyewitnesses like this, some ex-military, who believed they saw a missile that night, still think it was a missile today. Some saw missiles before while in combat, and they are expert witnesses of this tragedy. The airliner should have been visible to any observer witnessing a missile approach it. So the eyewitnesses almost certainly saw only the burning aircraft without realizing it. In fact, many eyewitnesses did see the jetliner before a second object approached it. To date, there is no evidence that anyone saw a missile shoot down TWA Flight 800. This is false. The FBI's criminal investigation was launched because there were so many eyewitnesses who saw something rise off the surface and head toward that aircraft before it exploded. Some of these were ex-military who said it was a missile. Many were lay people who said it was a missile. When the FBI interviewed these people, they too concluded that it most likely was a missile, specifically a man-pad missile. The CIA was brought in afterwards to create this animation. They didn't interview any of these people. The FBI agents assigned to determine what it was the eyewitnesses saw strongly objected to the CIA's analysis six months before it was released. They said it didn't conform to what Dwight Brumley saw. They said it didn't conform to what many other eyewitnesses saw. They actually said to the CIA that they should retract their video and their analysis until they correlate it with the radar data. When the CIA realized that it could not be correlated with the radar data, they released it anyway. The forensic evidence corroborates the eyewitness accounts. There were inward penetrations into the fuselage. There were explosive traces found throughout the wreckage. There were high-velocity fractures found on multiple pieces of wreckage. There was high-speed debris tracked by radar. This is all consistent with the FBI's original conclusion that the eyewitnesses did in fact see a missile. The real question to ask here is, why was the CIA brought in at all? And why did the FBI end up going along with their analysis? And why was this the video entered into the official crash investigation record. Initial speculation that a missile was involved was based totally on the statements of eyewitnesses who were seeking to assist the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the National Transportation Safety Board as these agencies probed into the possible causes of the tragedy. Without the assistance of these eyewitnesses, the accounting given here would not have been possible. This CIA video wasn't created with the assistance of eyewitnesses. They didn't interview any eyewitnesses. It was made despite their availability. Eyewitness evidence was suppressed and distorted. And what the CIA also did was rely on sound eyewitnesses who had no information on what caused the crash of TWA Flight 800.